I'm Gwena Limfeld. I'm a research professor in biogeochemistry at the uh, French National Center for Scientific Research, uh, here based in, um, in Strasbourg. And I'm also the director of the initiative in sustainability and the environment at the University of Strasbourg. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Noah Walker Crawford. So Noah is a postdoctoral research fellow of the Economic and Social Research Council in Political Science at University College London. He is a publicly engaged uh, researcher on climate change and climate litigation. Noah holds a PhD in Social Anthropology from the University of Manchester. During his PhD, he spent a semester at the Howard Kennedy College as a visiting research fellow in the program on science, technology, and society. Alongside his academic work, he is engaged in climate justice advocacy. The work of NOAA examines the knowledges and notions of responsibility at stake in discussions about climate change. His research looks at the use of science in climate litigation. So, NOAA, please. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to see that so many people are still here so late in the afternoon. I hope you all managed to get a coffee in the break. And uh, yeah, the same goes for the people following this on YouTube. I uh, hope you're enjoying the discussion so far. And uh, I'm going to try and entertain you all in the next half hour. So uh, as we've been hearing today, uh, climate change and climate science can be a bit confusing for lawyers and judges. But as we, as, we, as we've also heard, uh, how climate is interpreted in a legal context is crucial for how climate litigation cases are resolved. And what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, the challenges courts face when there are disputes about science and about what kind of science uh, should count to decide on legal issues. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about how uh, some defendants in different cases have reacted to climate litigation, uh, specifically uh, fossil fuel companies who've been sued over their contribution to climate change. And I'm going to use this as an example to reflect about the translation and legal interpretation of science uh, for, uh, in courts. And um, as far as climate litigation goes, there's been an interesting development in the past few years. Um, up until a little bit further back, a lot of fossil fuel companies were denying climate change. They were saying, ah, it's climate science, it's, it's ridiculous, humans aren't contributing to climate change, it's probably not even happening. But more recently, that's changed. And these days, in, uh, at least in recent uh, climate litigation cases, uh, fossil fuel companies are saying, yes, of course, climate change exists, and we're very concerned about this, and yeah, we want to be part of the solution. But nevertheless, they refuse to accept any kind of legal responsibility to deal with uh, the impacts of climate change and to reduce emissions. And one way they do this is through very creative scientific arguments, or more specifically, through creative interpretations of the science uh, in a legal context. And so really what I want to say or what I'll be talking about is uh, that uh, in, uh, we need to be careful when looking at how science is presented in a legal context because potentially it can be presented in ways that ultimately run counter to what the science is trying to achieve. So uh, today I'm going to give a brief overview of uh, how science is used in the legal context, the differences between scientific and legal knowledge, which we've heard a lot about today already. Uh, then I'm going to jump into some examples. I'll talk about four different cases and the strategies uh, fossil fuel defendants have used um, to uh, um, de defend themselves against cases and to argue on the science. And then I'll end with a few broader reflections about what all of this means for climate litigation going forward. So first of all, law and science are both regimes of knowledge production. So they're both you know, trying to figure out the truth, but they're doing that in different ways. So you know, science is all about understanding the world around us, about understanding how environments work, about how you know, humans and animals function. 
and this, uh, scientific knowledge production is a kind of a long open-ended process you know scientists will do studies they'll produce research other they'll, they'll publish articles other scientists will pick up on that and so science is kind of always in in development and they're always you know it's uh, new insights coming out while in a legal context you know uh, to make decisions courts have to figure out what's true they have to determine, you know, they have to separate the truth from what's not true. And so courts in this sense are also trying to come up with knowledge, but in a much more closed sense. So while, like I said, science is open-ended, the judges want to know the facts. They want to know guilty or not guilty, responsible or not responsible. And so uh, what that means in practice is that what uh, counts as to be true or legitimate knowledge in science isn't necessarily uh, le a legitimate fact in law. And that's why there's this process of translation like we've been hearing a lot about today. And then legal, um, in, uh, in doing this, legal practitioners are engaging in interpretation. They're fitting the science into the legal framework. But that can be quite a big challenge, especially when we come to an issue like climate change. And climate change is still a fairly new topic in a, in a legal context, because as we know, legal systems are uh, kind of evolve very slowly. And uh, so far, well, we, we see an increasing number of climate change cases around the world in lots of different courts, including here in Strasbourg. There are still a lot of open questions about how existing legal standards of proof should be applied to climate change. So now I'm going to jump into some examples to, to talk about how these discussions play out in practice. And I'm going to be talking about four different cases, uh, just uh, to introduce them very briefly. Uh, the first one we've already heard about today um, in, in some other presentations, it's the case of uh, Luciano Yulia against Arda Louis. So this is a case of a Peruvian farmer who's affected by glacial retreat and flood risk in the Peruvian Andes, and he sued a German energy company uh, trying to get them to help pay for uh, measures to reduce flood risk in the Andes. So it's all about, uh, you know, it's, it's basically, it's a nuisance case to establish uh, ca uh, uh, causal responsibility in relation to climate change. And then the, another case is uh, Milieu Defensi against Shell uh, in the Netherlands. Um, so this is a case uh, brought by an environmental NGO uh, trying to get Shell to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions going forward in the future. Um, and uh, this case was actually successful at a lower court. So uh, in 2021, the court ruled that Shell has to reduce its emissions drastically going forward. And uh, the case is uh, pending appeal. Um, the first case I've just uh, I forgot to mention against uh, the RWE. This case is still pending in the German courts, um, like uh, Rupert Stuart Smith was talking about earlier. It was rejected by a lower court and then was later found to be uh, admissible and is currently in the evidentiary stage. Um, and then the final two cases I'll be talking about are from the United States. And so in the U.S., around two dozen uh, cities and states have sued major fossil fuel companies and uh, CO2 emitters uh, over their contribution to climate change. And so this has to do, for instance, with uh, uh, climate change impacts related to sea level rise that affect a lot of different areas. Also, has these, uh, some of these cases also have to do with the fact that, or that uh, the plaintiffs are alleging that these companies knew about the harms that climate change was causing and yet continued to engage in these uh, forms of um, energy production. Uh, and the, the cases I'll be talking about are the ones uh, by the city of Oakland against BP and others. So this uh, mainly has to do with sea level rise affecting Oakland and California. Um, that's been going on since 2017. And then the other case is uh, Honolulu against Sunoco and other uh, companies that's been going since 2020. Uh, and these cases have been bogged down in the courts for a few years over uh, legal issues to do with jurisdiction of whether they should be heard in state or federal court. Um, yeah, and um, I've uh, analyzed uh, legal briefs and looked at court hearings in these different cases to see how scientific issues have been uh, discussed. Um, and I've also been involved in the uh, Luciano Yuya against RWE case uh, as an advisor to the plaintiff's legal team on scientific issues. 
And so in these cases, there are a lot of, what I found is that there are a lot of overlapping arguments in terms of uh, what the defendants are saying about the science, which in a way isn't surprising because in some of these cases, it's actually the same companies that are defendants or also the same law firms that are uh, representing these companies. And uh, what I found is that there are three broad strategies that these companies are using to argue on the science. The first is to say, it's not us who are causing the problem, but it's society as a whole. Then the second line of argumentation is to focus on scientific uncertainty and to basically say that, yeah, the science you know, is great, but it's not uh, good enough to uh, hold up to legal standards of proof. And then the third line of argumentation is to attack the credibility of individual scientists who are presenting evidence. So, and I'm going to go through these individually and, and give you some examples of, of how this looks in practice. So the first argument is to say that uh, the science points to the responsibility not of individual companies, but of, societies, uh, uh, but of uh, society as a whole. So what that means to say is that these companies, you know, they, they aren't uh, part, they haven't contributed to the problem, rather they contributed to the common good through their activities and really, you know, the consequence of that argumentation is to say that, you know, this is a political issue, this shouldn't be resolved uh, through the courts in terms of the responsibility of, of individual companies. And so this uh, line of argumentation to blame society, I found that in all of these four cases I was looking at in different forms. So, for example, both um, Chevron in the Oakland case and Shell in the Dutch case uh, cited the same pa the passage from the IPCC's fifth assessment report, which says that uh, greenhouse gas emissions are driven by population size, economic activity, lifestyle, energy use, land use patterns, techn technology, and climate policy. And in the Oakland case, uh, Chevron's lawyers took this to mean that they, they say, they interpret this to say that the IPCC is saying that emissions are not driven by oil extraction and production, but rather they're driven by economic activity. And in the Dutch case, Shell, citing the same passage, says that emissions are driven by energy demand, not energy supply. In the Honolulu case, Chevron says that it's actually misguided to blame a handful of energy companies. And they point out to the fact that the United States government even promoted the use of fossil fuels despite knowing about the dangers. So really what they're saying is, you know, we were just, you know, providing a public service through providing this energy to people that everyone needed. And they say that, you know, through this, they were really providing a public good. So, for example, Shell says in the Dutch case that the company was serving fundamental uh, social interests, satisfying basic human needs. They even go so far to say is that the Shell, through, uh, uh, you know, production of greenhouse gases, was helping achieve the United States uh, sustainable development goals. And in a similar sense, R. W. Louis' lawyer said in a hearing in the German case that their emissions were produced for the common good to ensure an energy supply for the population. And so ultimately, what they argue as a consequence is that political solutions are needed. So in the Honolulu case, Chevron says that, you know, really climate change needs global political action. And Shell says in the Dutch case that uh, it's the responsibility of governments to set the regulatory framework for addressing climate change and not the responsibility of individual companies. And what's important to say here is that, uh, you know, it, it's a, um, uh, the, the companies are making broad political arguments to say that uh, climate change, you know, is to blame, the, um, to blame on society as a whole and that we need political solutions. And you know, it's not to say that that's, uh, you know, they shouldn't be saying that. That's a perfectly legitimate uh, political position to have. But what's important to point out is that that's, uh, this is not something that the science says. You know, that's a, we could say a kind of a gross misinterpretation of the IPCC to say that the IPCC says oil production doesn't lead to climate change. So um, that's why when assessing these kinds of arguments, um, it's important to consider, you know, in what context they're being made and to see how, uh, you know, creative interpretations of the science can lead to potentially uh, misleading lines of argumentation.
So, the second point, after uh, blaming society, another strategy that uh, fossil fuel defendants have used is to focus on scientific uncertainty. The basic argument here is to say that, you know, climate science is great for, you know, helping us understand the problem, maybe even for, you know, to come up with political solutions, but the science isn't good enough to hold up to legal standards of proof or to establish legal causality. And so here, you know, it's important to point out that uh, these companies, they aren't engaging in climate skepticism. They're not, you know, questioning whether humans are causing global warming, but they're f uh, putting a lot of emphasis on the uncertainties in the science. And of course, this sometimes uh, ends up going in the direction of what climate skeptics are saying, because climate skeptics also tend to highlight the uncertainties. And so to give you a few examples of, of how this plays out in legal practice, in the Dutch case, uh, Shell argued that the evidence only points to the company's indirect contribution to climate change. They said they've produced a negligible amount of emissions overall. Both RWE and Shell point to numerous natural and anthropogenic factors that are contributing or that are at play in global warming. So they say, yes, of course, you know, fossil fuels are a part. They're, they're not denying that, but they say there's also land use change. There's also volcanoes and, you know, lots of other factors uh, that, that have a role to play here, meaning it's all maybe a little bit too complicated for us to really understand. Both uh, Shell and RWE has also argued that uh, to prove legal responsibility, really what you'd need to do is trace each individual CO2 particle. So when, you know, RWE, their, most of their emissions come from the uh, coal-fired energy production over the past hundred years. So really what they're saying, what you need to do is go to the factory and, and see where each in, how each individual CO2 particle is going up into the atmosphere and see what impact that's causing. But of course, that's, you know, that's impossible. You know, that's uh, from a scientific standpoint, we're never going to be able to do that. So really what they're doing when they're saying this is they're setting the standard of proof impossibly high. And uh, finally, uh, these uh, defendants are highlighting the uncertainties in climate modeling. So for example, in the Oakland case, uh, Chevron's lawyer uh, pointed to the fact that climate models are so complex that that makes them prone to errors. They, um, the lawyer highlighted the fact that in longer term climate modeling, there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly how high sea level rise will be, you know, depending on, you know, there are different scenarios and it might be, you know, one meter or three meters or much more than that. And they say that, well, if, you know, that we don't really know, then we can't establish any kind of legal proof in that regard. <coughs> And then in the RWE case, uh, there's actually been an um, attribution study uh, looking specifically at the, um, the glacier at stake here. So this case has to do with a glacier that melted and led to um, the, a glacial lake filling up with water, and that causes a risk of flooding to the plaintiff and to around 50,000 people who live in the, in the valley below. And uh, we actually heard about this study earlier today in uh, Rupert Stewart Smith's presentation. He, he was the lead author on this study, and uh, which, well, according to him, used the latest uh, peer-reviewed uh, methodologies in climate science. According to RWE's lawyers, uh, this model is unreliable because there's insufficient temperature data available from the Andes. And in a sense, they're, they're pointing to a, a broader issue, namely that um, in, in a lot of countries, especially in the global south, there isn't so much research and there isn't so much historical data available showing exactly how temperatures have developed in different places. Uh, but of course, that's the whole point of climate models, which have become very good at showing us you know, how temperatures have developed at different scales, even if you know, there wasn't a temperature, like a, a, a measurement station on top of every mountain in the Andes or wherever in the world. But uh, here again, um, the, the defendants are setting the evidentiary standard extremely high by saying that, you know, for this case to be successful, you would have had to have temperature measurements from this one glacier going back decades and decades, which of course uh, don't exist. And uh, this same uh, study uh, that looked at the, the attribution of 
uh, flood of glacial retreat and flood risk to anthropogenic climate change also included some glacier modeling. So basically modeled how exactly this glacier has retreated over the past decades. And while it's not in question that this glacier has retreated, like if you go there, you can look at historical photographs and see like back in the day, the glacier was down here and now the glacier is like way further up on the mountain because it's melted off. Uh, RWE's lawyers uh, question the validity of this model because they say it's not precise enough in modeling exactly how the glacier retreated and like when it was where and uh, how exactly that happened. And so they, they say the model isn't accurate enough. And so they conclude based on that that even if such models may be a relevant instrument for science, they do not fulfill the legal standard for causation and evidence. And that really kind of summarizes this whole line of argumentation of uh, so defendants are pointing to the uncertainties in climate science to say that, you know, the science you know, might be great, might be fun to read, but really it's, you know, not very useful in a legal context. So after blaming society, after highlighting uncertainties, uh, the final strategy that uh, these fossil fuel defendants have been using, uh, according to my research, is that they attack the credibility of individual scientists. And so what they're saying here is that the authors of certain studies are biased, which means the evidence is illegitimate and it shouldn't count in court. So, for example, uh, one important piece of evidence in both the cases against Shell and RWE is the carbon major study. So this was a big piece of research uh, done over many years, which quantified historic emissions and linked them to individual companies. So it found that around 90 companies are responsible for 70% of historic industrial emissions. And it put specific numbers to that. So it said, you know, um, I think highest up on the list is, I think, ExxonMobil with something over 3% and Saudi Aramco with around 3% as well. And then a bit further down on the list, you have uh, Shell and RWE. And uh, with Shell, uh, in, the, in the case in the Netherlands, Shell's lawyers argued that uh, they, they found that uh, part of the uh, research underlying the study was commissioned by Greenpeace. And because you know, Greenpeace is an activist organization, they said that these results are irrelevant. They should be discounted, even if you know, they were published in uh, peer-reviewed scientific journals. And then uh, in the RWE case, there have been uh, a lot of detailed uh, discussions about scientific evidence because uh, this is uh, this case is one of the few that's gone into the evidentiary stage uh, so far that's actually gone into detailed discussions on the science. And so uh, when the court first entered the evidentiary stage, they wanted to appoint uh, uh, experts, you know, independent experts to advise the court on the science because, you know, of course, the, the judges themselves aren't scientific experts. And so they asked both uh, parties to put forward examples of, you know, who would be good, you know, impartial experts to advise the court. And the plaintiff's lawyers put forward the name of uh, Friederike Otto, who's a very well-known uh, German climate scientist. It's like she's uh, uh, often, you know, speaks to the media. She's she's kind of one of these, you know, public faces of climate science, and very well respected. Uh, RWE's lawyers argued that she is completely biased, and as proof of that, they pulled up some old Twitter posts she had made. So, for example, once uh, uh, she uh, shared on Twitter an article about a climate litigation uh, lawsuit and said, oh, this is interesting, literally. And, they, and then RWE's lawyers put this forward as evidence, saying she supports climate litigation and she's biased against fossil fuel companies. And as additional proof of this, uh, they took the fact that she had been a speaker on some panels uh, organized by Client Earth, which is an uh, in, uh, environmental NGO engaged in climate litigation. Um, so in this sense, you know, being part of public discussions about uh, uh, climate change and climate law makes a scientist suspect. Then another example of this is, uh, of course, um, I've already mentioned that an important piece of evidence in this case is an attribution study done by uh, Rupert Stewart Smith, who spoke earlier, and a number of other authors. And 
um, the uh, uh, again RWE's lawyers attacked these studies authors arguing that they were biased so first of all they claimed without providing any proof that the plaintiffs were involved in the production of this study even though this was independent research they also said that the authors have quote publicly positioned themselves as enemies of CO2 emitters um, maybe in the in the coffee break you can ask Rupert if he thinks he's an enemy of CO2 emitters I'm, I'm not sure um, as proof of this, again, they pulled up some of Rupert's Twitter posts where he was, you know, posting about climate litigation. They also uh, referred to the fact that uh, when he was an undergrad, he was a member of a student group at uh, the University of Oxford engaged on climate change. So again, it seems like any kind of, you know, interest or, or public engagement on climate change makes a scientist biased. And according to this line of argumentation, if the authors of relevant studies are potentially suspect, then the evidence is invalid in the legal context. So now um, to slowly come to the end, I'm going to uh, end with a few broader reflections uh, based on the discussion of these examples. First of all, in climate litigation going forward, a key issue is the standard of proof, the standard of evidence, and how those standards are interpreted in relation to climate change. What we've seen in these examples from four different cases is that uh, uh, litigants or plaint uh, parties can uh, creatively interpret legal standards to make any kind of evidence appear invalid by setting the legal standard impossibly high or interpreting it to be so high that any evidence uh, the, that might be relevant doesn't end up counting. And so here judges have a really crucial role in interpreting standards of evidence which were probably not designed with climate change in mind, which you know are much older than you know the broad public knowledge about climate change, and uh, so so judges you know need to figure out how to apply uh, these uh, standards of proof in times of climate change, and this is going to be key in affecting you know how a lot of these cases might turn out when they come to these fundamental scientific issues. Then a second point here is that scientific legal arguments are connected to broader ideas about how climate change should be addressed. So we've seen you know, how fossil fuel companies have, have interpreted some of the evidence, how they've said that you know, if scientists have some kind of interest in, the, in their subject matter, that means they're potentially biased. But you know, this line of argumentation can lead us to potentially absurd conclusions. For example, you might say in, in that sense that if a cancer researcher doesn't want people to die of cancer, that makes them biased in their cancer research. And uh, yeah, that, that, that doesn't really make any sense. And of course, uh, you know, we have peer review in science, and one of the reasons for that is to eliminate bias. And you know, that's why, especially you know, studies published in high-profile uh, scientific journals go through very rigorous processes of peer review uh, before you know they end up being presented as legal evidence in court. And what's important to recognize here is that there are broader issues that are pus pushing researchers to study climate change. Whether you know it's policymakers saying you know we need good knowledge on climate change, and that's you know one of the whole reasons that the IPCC exists in the first place. And, you know, this can also be public concern and or even, you know, researchers own worries about climate change. You know, people probably aren't going to study climate change out of pure boredom. They're going to study it because, you know, this is an important issue to a lot of people in our societies. And so, you know, what this shows us is that ultimately the production of knowledge on climate change is intertwined with people's concerns about the issue and ideas of, of what we should do about it. And a final point on all of this is that, you know, climate science and climate modeling obviously has limitations like any kinds of science, but, it's, but climate modeling is still a crucial tool for addressing climate change, for understanding the problem and figuring out what we can do about it, you know, whether that's in a legal or a political context. And so, of course, uh, climate modeling is getting ever more precise in showing us, you know, what the, how climatic processes are working, you know, what are the contributions, what are the impacts, what are the different scenarios over many years, depending on, you know, what emissions we produce in the future. What's important to recognize here, and, and especially uh, you know, thinking about climate, in thinking about climate litigation, 
is that climate models aren't going to answer ethical questions about who's responsible for who should take responsibility for climate change or about which impacts are the most important to address. But climate models can help, uh, can help us answer those ethical questions, whether it's in a legal or a political context. And so, uh, you know, scientific models may have underlying uncertainties. You know, they may tell, you know, they're, they're never going to give us absolute truth. They're never going to give us 100% certainty. But, uh, you know, scientific uncertainty isn't anything new, in, neither in, in law nor in policy making. So, I mean, we, there are all kinds of other issues we've dealt with in the past, whether it's, you know, the dangers of smoking or asbestos or, you know, a whole lot of uh, different kinds of uh, environmental pollution. And so, um, of course, it's a challenge in climate litigation uh, to, to understand how this science fits into a legal context. But uh, ultimately, it's going to be up to courts to decide what level of certainty is needed to answer legal questions about climate change. And uh, just to end with a broader reflection on all of this uh, is the question of, you know, why are there so many climate change lawsuits in the first place? And one very important reason for that is that there's a sense of failure in climate politics, that we've had decades of discussions at a UN level, but the political processes aren't producing sufficient solutions. That's neither to limit emissions to a more or less safe level or to a not so dangerous level, uh, nor is it for addressing the devastating impacts of climate change around the world that we're already seeing and, of course, we're going to see more in the future. So in that sense, there's a real governance gap on climate change. And, uh, you know, we're seeing people's human rights affected. And so if p uh, political institutions aren't going to do their job of protecting people's rights, then ultimately it's no wonder that people are going to turn to the courts to have their rights protected. And so when these cases are brought, it's important that uh, courts rely on the best evidence to resolve them. Thank you. Thank you.